Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. It's on the wall. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Uh, Today is Sunday, November 17th. Yes, you heard that right. It is Sunday morning. And what that means is you're going to hear this podcast. For you, it's probably Sunday night around 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m. If you're on the East Coast, it's later. And you're like, Zach, I want to hear about Lamar Jackson versus Deshaun Watson. And my response is, guess what? I'm recording this before that game happens. We will talk about those games tomorrow. We'll talk about the NFL games that are happening in a couple of hours. We'll talk about them tomorrow on Monday. Today's show is all about college football. Yesterday, we'll do a film analysis of Gardner Minshew. I'm very excited. We'll talk about his, his uh, offensive coordinator, John DiFilippo. We're going to talk about Tua Tungvaloa. He got injured. We'll do an Ask Zach topic about that. Uh, we're going to talk about Minnesota, why they lost. We will talk about Jalen Hurts and his historic comeback against uh, Baylor. It was a fun game. I watched a lot of football yesterday. We have a lot to talk about in the college football world and the gardner Mitchell film analysis. And that is where I want to start. So, uh, in case somehow somebody missed it, Gardner Minshew is the rookie quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He got the opportunity to play for the first nine weeks of the NFL season because during the very first game of the year for the Jacksonville Jaguars, their starting quarterback, Nick Foles, got hurt. And recently, as of actually today, Gardner Minshew was benched. They are now playing Nick Foles again. He's back. He's healthy. And, uh... I have a lot to say about Gardner Minshew being benched. We'll talk about that later in this topic. Um, But first, I want to generally just break down his play and talk about what the film says when I watch Gardner Minshew. This is what the film says about Gardner Minshew. So what I see on tape is that Gardner Minshew should be, he should be a starting quarterback in the NFL. It's a shame for him to not be playing. Uh, I'll discuss the situation in Jacksonville. He got benched. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But to be very clear, Gardner can play. In fact, if he was in Pittsburgh, he would be the Steelers' starting quarterback right now, today, easily over Mason Rudolph. He does so many things right. He's a distributor. He gets the ball to his playmakers. He doesn't force the ball into coverage. He's not afraid to check down and take short completions when that's all the defense gives him. But he's also got a great arm. It'd be very easy for us to say, well, Gardner Minshew just throws checkdowns and throws underneath. That's not the case. That is not true. He's got a great arm. He can beat man coverage. Uh, In college, I was concerned about his arm strength. Well, he made subtle changes to his mechanics over the offseason. Between his last year in college and this rookie year in the NFL, he made some changes. He now uses his legs and his core to generate more force throwing the ball Um, He's got more zip on the ball. His arm is now stronger than it was in college. And here's the kicker. The dude is great at reading defenses. He understands matchups. He puts the ball in the right spot. He's not a one-read quarterback. He can look at his first read, then go, hey, that's not open. What about my second option? What about my third option? What about my fourth option? He regularly does that. Gardner Minshew is not, I repeat, is not a one-read quarterback. Watch Gardner's eyes. He regularly throws to a second, third, and even fourth read. Gardner Minshew is also great, fantastic within the pocket. He is so good at making subtle movements. Uh, One step to the left, a step forward, maybe a step to the right, or a slide up in the pocket diagonally. He's great at moving within the pocket. That eight-yard by roughly eight-yard area where linemen are protecting him, Gardner Minshew thrives in that area. He does a great job maneuvering within the pocket, keeping his eyes downfield, resetting his feet, and throwing accurately downfield. This is something that Mason Rudolph, the Steelers quarterback, really, really struggles with. Gardner Minshew is light years ahead of him, and I am so impressed when I watch the tape. And then there's this one thing Gardner Minshew does. I call it his X factor. This is the thing that makes Gardner Minshew Gardner Minshew. It's an ability that is incredibly rare. No, it's not just as leadership. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, look, I know I love leadership. I talk about it all the time. Gardner Minshew's ability to extend plays is something that, I mean, Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, and then, then there's Gardner Minshew. 
I mean, he belongs with those names. The way Gardner Minshew is able to extend plays, keep his eyes downfield, I cannot even properly describe the amount of times I watched him turn a bad situation into a big gain and a big play downfield. He is one of the most unpredictable quarterbacks I have ever watched in my entire life. If you were to make an analogy about Tom Brady as a quarterback, you would say that Tom Brady is like the accountant of quarterbacks. He's kind of boring. He sits at a desk forever, does the same thing every single day. But guess what? He's very successful. On the other hand, Gardner Minshew is like an artist. Picture Gardner Minshew painting in flip-flops in his apartment and making incredible artwork. Don't get confused. Gardner Minshew can be a traditional quarterback who wins from the pocket, but his best moments, Gardner Minshew's best moments, come when he's running around outside the pocket and improvising. Take a touchdown against the Jets, for example. He drops back. Nobody's open. What do you do in this situation? What he does is keep the play alive, keeps his eyes downfield, and waits until somebody eventually does come open and he throws a touchdown. That's what Gardner Minshew does over and over and over again. He makes plays in all kinds of creative ways. He has underhand throws. He has weird plays where he runs around and avoids sacks. And for the person in their living room, the person watching football on the television, he's just a joy to watch. It's a pleasure. Now, there is a downside to Gardner Minshew. Number one is that his creativity doesn't always work. Uh, If you want to be a creative, spontaneous player at quarterback, your teammates have to help you. If you're going to make a weird shovel pass that your running back doesn't expect, he has to step up to the plate and catch the ball when it hits him in the hands. His improvisation doesn't always work. But more importantly, the big flaw with Gardner Minshew's style of play is that he holds on to the ball arguably way too long. In fact, I think you could say it is too long, but you're willing to live with it because of the positives that it brings. If you want all the good, fun, exciting, unpredictable plays that Gardner Minshew can make happen, then you need to be willing to pay the price. Sometimes he'll just hold on to the ball way too long. He'll get sacked or he'll get hit as he's throwing and fumble, and the results are bad. The results are turnovers. The results are gigantic losses where you lose 8 yards, 12 yards, or turn the ball over entirely. But let me be very, very clear. The person I'm describing sounds a lot like Johnny Manziel. He is not Johnny Manziel. He's far better from the pocket, and he doesn't throw ugly interceptions. His flaw, his fatal flaw, is he holds onto the ball too long, where he either loses yards occasionally, or he literally fumbles because he's running around behind the line of scrimmage, and he gets hit and doesn't expect a hit. That's it. Gardner Meach has only thrown four interceptions this season, And I can actually only find three of them on tape. It's very odd. I've never had this problem where it's listed that he throws two interceptions in his second game against the Houston Texans. I can't actually find the second interception. One interception was tipped off of his receiver's hands, literally. His interception, the one I could find against the Houston Texans, was a bad pass. He's standing in the pocket. He just threw a high pass. It wasn't accurate. It got picked off. And then he had an interception against the Saints because of a miscommunication where the receiver stopped. He threw the ball like the receiver was going to keep running. Something went wrong there. My point is that his interceptions are not horrible, awful decisions. He does not. He does not force the ball into coverage. If nobody's open, he will either check down. And if the check down's covered or if he can't make it happen or if there's pressure coming to Gardner Minshew, he'll run around. He'll extend the play. He'll keep his eyes downfield and create a play downfield. The one thing he does not do, I repeat this over and over again, Gardner Minshew does not force the ball into coverage trying to throw to receivers that are not open. He does not do that. Now, sometimes his improvisation does lead to negative plays, but I think, honestly, his style of play brings far more positives than negatives. Now, my guess is that His style of play made the Jacksonville coaching staff somewhat uncomfortable. And there are a lot of reasons you can list to justify benching Gardner Minshew in favor of Nick Foles. Uh, Number one is that the Jacksonville Jaguars paid Nick Foles a ton of money this offseason. They paid him to be a starting quarterback. The Jaguars are not paying Nick Foles to sit on the bench behind a sixth-round draft pick. 
Number two is that uh, the Jaguars offensive coordinator is a guy named John DiFilippo. He has history with Nick Foles. Nick Foles and John DiFilippo worked together the year Nick Foles and the Eagles won a Super Bowl. The Jaguars made a very conscious decision. We're going to bring in Nick Foles. We're going to bring in John DiFilippo. They've worked together. They've had success together. We're going to have that success again here in Jacksonville. That has been the plan with the Jaguars. I mean, look, they won a Super Bowl together. Here's the other thing. Number three is that the Jaguars are not winning a lot of games. They have four wins this year. If Gardner Minshew was 8-2 and two and was doing phenomenal all year, he would not get benched. It kind of reminds me, actually, of the way that uh, Dak Prescott became the starting quarterback in Dallas. He replaced Tony Romo, a really good, well-established quarterback. But, Gardner, but uh, Dak Prescott kept winning. And he kept win- winning, and he kept winning, and he kept winning, and the team didn't want to screw it up because it was working. If Gardner Minshew was winning a lot of games, he wouldn't have gotten benched, but he wasn't. And then number four, I think a big part of this is Gardner Minshew has an unpredictable play style. Uh, he generates some negative plays that I think teams are uncomfortable with. And uh, like for example, there's a play against the Houston Texans where he refuses to slide. For whatever reason, it's first down. It's not like it's a huge down where he needs the yards. He's running. He refuses to slide. He gets hit. The ball gets knocked away. It's hard for a coach to coach a guy like Gardner Minshew who succeeds so much because of his improvisation outside of structure, right? It's uh, the coach can't manage it because the guy is succeeding with his own magic rather than the coach's play calling. That's really difficult. Now, when you combine all of these factors, it makes sense to me, okay, that's why the Jacksonville Jaguars are not playing a really good quarterback Gardner Minshew, a guy who's polarizing, who's really successful, who the fans love. It all makes sense to me, and I don't blame the Jaguars for benching Gardner Minshew in favor of Nick Foles. Uh, In my opinion, though, Gardner Minshew has to be, of all the quarterbacks ever benched, I think Gardner Minshew has to be playing at the highest level of any quarterback ever to be benched in NFL history. Literally, I don't think any quarterback has played as well as he has and gotten benched Ever. It's very bizarre. It's very interesting. But a lot of factors behind the scenes are playing into this decision. Um, and I wish them luck. Now, number one is that a lot of teams in the NFL would be lucky and grateful to have Gardner Minshew. I think the Redskins would love to have him. I think that the Steelers would love to have him. There are, there are a lot of teams around the NFL that say, Gardner Minshew, that rookie contract, absolutely, let's take him. He can play. We can build around him. So I'm curious to see how the Jaguars do without Gardner Mitchell. They have Nick Foles coming in, and the thing they're going to lose, the number one thing, I think some people think it's a positive, they'll have fewer turnovers, uh, they will be more predictable, but the number one thing they will lose, for better or worse, is Gardner Mitchell's ability to extend plays. Will that hurt the Jaguars, or will that help the Jaguars? That is what we will find out. They don't have a quarterback now who can escape a sack, run around, keep his eyes downfield, and turn a loss of yardage into a gigantic 40-yard touchdown pass. Nick Foles, for all the good things he does, he's good in structure, I believe, I hope so. The one thing Nick Foles cannot do that Gardner Minshew can do is extend a play, run around, turn a negative play, a loss, an eight-yard sack, turn a play like that into a 40-yard touchdown pass. Will the Jaguars regret benching Gardner Minshew? That's a narrative I'm really excited to find out. But that is why I love watching Gardner Minshew. He's a great leader. Uh, I also met him once in college. Um, I was filming for Pac-12 Network at the time, their daily show, whatever it was. And I got to be on set with Gardner Minshew. And he told me, I'm going to read the quote word for word. He said, life is an adventure, and I'm just trying to make the most of it. And it seems like to me, Gardner Minshew sure did make the most of his adventure and his time playing quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I would be shocked we don't see him start an NFL game again next year or later this year. Who knows? In my opinion, Gardner Minshew is a starting quarterback for some team in the NFL in the future, whether it's the Jaguars or not. The talent is there. He's incredibly gifted, and he does some special stuff that just cannot be coached. All right. Um, By the way, while I was watching the film of the Jacksonville Jaguars offense and Gardner Minshew, I couldn't help but notice how well they ran the ball, and how frequently the Jaguars ran the ball. Uh, The Jaguars built their offense with Gardner Minshew around running the ball, then using play action, faking the run, 
and then using that run fake to throw the ball vertically downfield. Again, I, I want to be very, very clear. I saw run after run after successful run after big run after 81-yard touchdown run. Like, I am talking the Jaguars have a highly successful running game. And here's the irony in all of this. The Jaguars' offensive coordinator is a guy named John DiFilippo. And guess why he was fired from his last job in Minnesota? He was fired by the Minnesota Vikings and, more specifically, by their head coach, Mike Zimmer. He was fired by the Minnesota Vikings because his offense last year with the Vikings could not run the ball well enough. Despite the fact, by the way, <laughs> huge important detail, uh, the Vikings running back Dalvin Cook got hurt last year. And their offensive line, their personnel on the offensive line, the people they had playing on the offensive line were awful and terrible. Their worst offensive lineman was one of their best ones last year. Riley Reef was hurt all last year. They had a guy named Pat Elfline playing center for the Vikings who is atrocious, who is a terrible center. He's a little better at guard. He's not really great. But the point is, to me, when I look at what happened with the Jaguars this year, the way they've been running the ball. And then I watched the film. I did a whole film analysis of Kirk Cousins, and I talked a lot about John DiFilippo. I do not think that John DiFilippo was great last year with the Minnesota Vikings. I think he failed in one aspect where he did not do a good enough job adjusting to say, hey, our offensive line is terrible. We should probably change our approach with play calling because what we're trying to do isn't working given the offensive line personnel we have. But I do believe... This is very important. I believe that John DiFilippo took way too much of the blame last year for the Minnesota Vikings failures. In fact, I think he was somewhat of a scapegoat, in my opinion. Uh, Mike Zimmer was afraid for his job. He's a head coach of the Vikings. And I think he did not like John DiFilippo. They did not get along for whatever reason. And so the scapegoat and the reason to fire, they found a reason to fire him. You're not running the ball well enough. To me, that's silly and nonsense. It's just not true. He can design an offense around running the ball clearly by what we've seen with the Jaguars. And I think Mike Zimmer just didn't like him. And Mike Zimmer didn't want to lose his job. So he found a guy to blame. He blamed John DiFilippo. He got rid of him. And ironically, this year, oh, by the way, <laughs> the Minnesota Vikings have had problems again earlier this year. They seem to be ironed out now. But there was a period where there was a significant strife between Stephon Diggs and Adam Thielen and the quarterback Kirk Cousins. And it appeared like they were taking subtle digs at their coach saying, we can't just run the ball all the time because that's what Zimmer regularly preaches. We got to run the ball regularly. So again, uh, the Vikings, I think, put too much blame on John DeFilippo. Yes, he's the offensive coordinator. Yes, his job is to put out a successful offense. He failed doing that last year. But I think the whole narrative that he didn't run the ball enough or he couldn't design an offense running the ball, it's just flat out wrong because what I saw on film with the Jacksonville Jaguars was an offensive coach who had creative play calls, who did a good job creating matchups. He took a backup quarterback, Gardner Minshew, and made him look good. Gardner Minshew did a lot of the work. Gardner Minshew's an incredible quarterback. But it's not like the coach didn't play any part in that. John DeFilippo was not a terrible offensive coordinator. And by the way, the Jaguars run the ball really, really well. They do a good job. They run the ball fantastically. They have a great running back, Leonard Fournette. You can sure say, well, their running back's phenomenal. Well, isn't the running back in Minnesota also phenomenal? Except that he was hurt. All I'm saying is that the narrative that John Filippo should have been fired because he could not design an offense running the football. It's just fallacy. It's wrong. It's not true. That is what I saw when I watched the film of the Jacksonville Jaguars offense. Okay. Uh, yesterday, Oklahoma had a historic comeback. Oklahoma beat Baylor 34-31. to And, uh, oh my gosh, it was such a fun, fun win. Now, for you we nerdy stat people out there, I'm probably going to butcher the stat and get it wrong, but I got uh, a text from my friend. My friend literally said, uh, here's what he said to me. I don't know if this is right, but my buddy texted me. He said, this is the first time a team has come back from a 21-point deficit ever against a 9-0 team. So 
because people that love stats love to take arbitrary numbers. A 9-0 team, 21-point deficit, first time it's ever happened. Whoa! Oh my gosh! So, therefore, it's a historic win. I can't believe it. To, but, but to be very, very clear, what Oklahoma did last night was came back from a 25-point deficit. They were down 28-3 to at one point in that game. Oklahoma was losing to Baylor. And I talked a bunch of smack about Baylor. I was like, man, Baylor is going to get trounced by Oklahoma. Oh, boy. Uh, I, I was wrong. Oklahoma barely got out of there alive. It was a really fun, really entertaining game. Uh, and here is the kicker. By the way, Oklahoma has this, has this incredible comeback. Uh, it was fun. Uh, not even. It was really kind of an ugly, messy game where for the first half, Baylor was great. And for the second half, Oklahoma was great. And for the, you know, <laughs> the first half, Oklahoma was terrible. And the second half, Baylor was terrible. Like, it's just very one-sided halves of football. Um, but here's how the Big 12 Conference works. Baylor and Oklahoma are both members of the Big 12 Conference. And the way that the Big 12 Conference decides who plays in their conference championship is they just take, oddly enough, the two teams with the best records in their conference. Uh, a lot of teams have divisions. They'll be like the, the SEC West versus the SEC East, whatever, however you want it. Pac-12 West, Pac-12 North, Pac-12 South. The Big 12 was very different. The Big 12 takes the two teams with the best in-conference schedules. They play for the Big 12 championship. Right now, Baylor's 9-1 and one with a 6-1 and one record in conference, and Oklahoma is 9-1 and one with a 6-1 and one conference record. What that means is the matchup we saw last night between Baylor and Oklahoma could happen again in like three weeks on December 7th when the Big 12 championship is played, assuming that Baylor and Oklahoma both win out the rest of the year. Um, I'm excited for that game. I am. Uh, Baylor surprised me. They were better than I thought. I think Oklahoma was a little bit worse than I thought. Their defense did not impress me. Their front seven just cannot hang. And I think if Baylor, if Oklahoma does end up getting into the college football playoff, uh, I Jalen Hurts is not as great as I thought. He, like, he's good. He really struggled last night. And the the defensive line, the front seven, that's the linebacking core and the defensive linemen for Oklahoma, they got worked by Baylor. They got dominated by Baylor last night for most of that game. Uh, there is no way they're going to be able to compete with teams like Georgia or even Oregon or especially not Clemson, especially not Ohio State, especially not LSU. Uh, if Oklahoma does find a way to get into the top four and makes it into the college football playoff, I think they're going to get trounced because I think the level of line play they need on defense is not good enough. And the front seven on defense is a gigantic weakness and teams are going to gash them running the football the same way Baylor did last night for most of that game. Now, uh, last night, I want to talk about Jalen Hurts, the quarterback for Oklahoma. Last night was an incredible, fun moment where we saw Jalen Hurts have a cool comeback. And I was like, oh, Jalen Hurts, I'm happy for you. And I, I love Jalen Hurts. He's got an incredible story where he transferred out, out of Alabama. I've done a lot of coverage of it. Go back and watch it if you want. But he left Alabama there for reasons I, I don't want to get into today. It was really encouraging and inspiring. He stayed there and fought. And then when it didn't work, he left. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. So I, I love Jalen Hurts. I did not love what I saw last night. In fact, what I saw last night was very, very uh, discouraging. He had three turnovers. You know, he fumbled twice. He had an interception. He played badly. The, he threw the ball awful at times. And I want to ask a question. What does Jalen Hurts do that's elite as a quarterback? What is his skill set? What is the thing he does on the field, number one, that makes him elite? leadership I, like I, and look I love leadership leadership is phenomenal and the heart is so important like Tom Brady got to the NFL without being elite at anything he was just had a had a phenomenal heart was a great leader had a great work ethic and Tom Brady turned himself into the greatest NFL quarterback of all time right so if you want to just talk about that if you want to bet on the fact that Jalen Hurts is going to do the work and become an incredible NFL quarterback that way good luck uh what I see from Jalen Hurts is a guy who struggles to throw the football at times. Like, literally, his arm is it's just not good. The, the ball comes out wrong, and you're like, you, that's a five-yard pass to the right, and you you just skipped it to the guy, and it looked like you – looked. I thought it got tipped. There was a play last night where he threw, like, a literally a, a five-yard hitch to the right, and I thought the ball got tipped, and, in fact, it didn't. 
It just came out of his hand wrong and weird. And that's happened a lot over the time. And the velocity isn't there. The ball tends to die. And his deep ball isn't incredible. And he's good enough when guys are right open. I Sure. Um, but I want to... I want to recant something. And here's the definition of recant. Recant is to say that one no longer holds an opinion or a belief. Um, I once said that the Bears should draft Jalen Hurts. And maybe if they can get Jalen Hurts in the seventh round, I I guess. Um, But I I don't think you should build a team around Jalen Hurts in the NFL at all. I think, you know, looking back with more information, with me watching more Jalen Hurts this weekend, I watched the the Baylor game. I watched some more of the other games he played this year. And I was like, uh, that's, that's a very just bad take. Like my, my old take on that was just wrong and just bad. With more information, I'm like, yeah, Zach, you sound really stupid <laughs> to say that Baylor should draft Jalen Hurts. Um, what I said was, and I think I did Lamar Jackson a big disservice, I said that the Bears should draft Jalen Hurts and then build an offense around his skill set where you have a quarterback running the ball regularly. And I said, just I, I literally just broad stroke said, just do what the Ravens did with Lamar Jackson. Build an offense around Jalen Hurts' skill set, and it, that can work. <laughs> That's wrong. I was stupid. I, I was dead wrong when I said, like, with more information, I'm like, Zach, you're an idiot. Um, that's one of the dumbest takes I've had in a long time. Here's why. Um, first of all, it's incredibly disrespectful to Lamar Jackson. I want to ask the question again. What does Jalen Hurts do that is elite on the football field? Okay, Leadership. But it's not throwing the ball, which is very, I mean, for a quarterback, you want your quarterback, maybe your NFL quarterback especially, to be elite throwing the ball. But it's also not his running ability. Jalen Hurts runs the ball well for a college quarterback. But Jalen Hurts' running ability doesn't translate well to the NFL. Uh, Let's compare Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts, the Oklahoma quarterback today, runs until he's tackled. (laughs) What that means is, he runs, and then when defenders are in front of him, he gets tackled. He rarely breaks. I haven't seen a gigantic 70-yard touchdown run from Jalen Hurts at all this year. That's not who he is as a runner. Lamar Jackson runs until he scores. <laughs> Nobody tackles Lamar Jackson. They try, they fail. He either makes a miss or he runs right past him. Jalen Hurts is not that kind of runner for Alabama, or for, or for Oklahoma, excuse me. And so to say that, oh, let's just build an offense around Jalen Hurts' running ability— is just disrespectful to Lamar Jackson because what Lamar Jackson is is a special runner. He might be the best running quarterback we've ever seen. Jalen Hurts can run the ball. He's not the most special running quarterback we've ever seen and not even close. And so just what I said was very ignorant and wrong. <laughs> the, the, you can, I don't think, I have no faith that you can build an offense around Jalen Hurts' skill set because his skill set isn't good enough to succeed in the NFL. A lot of guys were, you know, he's a great college quarterback. He is. Uh, Tim Tebow was a great college quarterback. Troy Smith was a great college quarterback. Terrell Pryor, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Masoli uh, from Oregon, great college quarterback. Vernon Adams was a great college quarterback at Eastern Washington. Did they have NFL careers? No, they did not because their skill set did not translate to the NFL. That is how I feel about Jalen Hurts. I have one more thing to say about Jalen Hurts. I saw a narrative pop up yesterday. So if you're unfamiliar, Tua Tungavaloa, the quarterback at Alabama got hurt. And Jalen Hurts is a former quarterback at Alabama who transferred out of Alabama because he wanted playing time. And some people have been saying and sending me messages saying, man, if only Tua, excuse me, if only Jalen Hurts had stayed at Alabama right now, he'd be the man at Alabama. He'd be the best, he'd be the number one quarterback at Alabama. And uh, people are saying, you know, don't you think Jalen Hurts regrets leaving Alabama? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Jalen Hurts does not have even a whisper of regret leaving Alabama. I don't, I don't believe that. Let me speak from experience. When your team doesn't choose you to be their quarterback, and, you, and, and then the guy that plays that they chose gets hurt, you don't feel an ounce of remorse or guilty or bad because you want to play for a team that believes in you, that wants you, that wants you to be the guy. Oklahoma wanted Jalen Hurts to be their guy, their number one quarterback, the guy they believe in and build their offense around. Alabama, and I don't blame them. Tua Tungvaloa is a far better quarterback than Jalen Hurts, but that wasn't going to happen at Alabama. He got what he wanted at Oklahoma. He got a team that wanted to build around him. He's satisfied. Jalen Hurts is happy and satisfied with 
the situation he has at Oklahoma. He might not be happy they lost a game this year. He might not be happy with the ugly win they just had against Baylor. But he wouldn't trade a team like Oklahoma that believes in him and wants him for a team like Alabama where he's the second choice. Would you rather date a girl that, you know, really, really wanted you because she liked you? Or would you want to date a girl who really, really liked another guy but got stuck with you? Oh, I guess I'll date Zach because I can't have Jake. Or I guess I'll have Zach because Alex, Alex doesn't want me, right? <laughs> no. You want the girl that says, I want Zach. You want the school that says, I want you to be our starting quarterback. So I, I don't buy that at all. Let's end the narrative right now. Jalen Hurts is not jealous or upset about Alabama at all. Right now, uh, Mac Jones is the quarterback at Alabama because two is out for the year. And I don't think Jalen Hurts has blinked twice about it. I'm sure he's, there's a twinge of sadness because like, oh, my friends are there. And it'd be fun to play with my friends. That's always going to happen, right? Or your, your friends are, you left your friends behind. And that's painful. But just to recap everything I said, <laughs> very, you know, very briefly, uh, I think Oklahoma and Baylor are going to rematch in the Big 12 championship. I cannot wait for that game. Baylor is going to be hungry and angry, and they're going to want revenge. Uh, number two is that I don't think Jalen Hurts' skill set translates to the NFL unless he does a ton of work and totally changes the quarterback he is. And then number three, <laughs> Jalen Hurts is not upset that the quarterback job is open to Alabama. He has a great situation at Oklahoma. He's happy. Okay, I want to shift gears now to, well, I'm going to drink water first. My mouth is like dying. I have a, oof. What, 38? There's no way it's 38 minutes. I think I screwed up the first or I can't remember. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, well, first of all, right now, I, my brain is, it's weird to like talk, but also think about other stuff while you're talking. Like, has anyone ever tried that to multitask where you're talking about one thing, but you're thinking about another thing? That's very difficult. I'm looking at the time clock uh, of the recording I'm working on. And I'm, I'm trying to talk. It's just difficult. It's a very weird thing to do when you're like on autopilot talking, but your brain is thinking about something else. It's very, it's, it clearly doesn't work for me. So last night, yesterday, the University of Minnesota lost to Iowa 23 to 19. And man, oh, it, was a, it was a really fun game. I had a blast watching Iowa, Minnesota. Uh, I hope I said Minnesota. Did I say Michigan? Let me, let me just restart just in case. To be very clear, yesterday, the University of Minnesota lost to Iowa 23-19. And uh, I had a blast watching the game. It was awesome. Uh, there's this tradition where at the end of the first quarter, everybody in Iowa, that stadium, uh, they all wave up to the children's hospital on the 12th floor. And it's so cool. I, I just And then the lights came on and that stadium. Iowa looks like an incredible atmosphere to play football because everybody in that stadium, it's full. They're all there. They all love their team, and it just looks like a blast. That atmosphere at Iowa is awesome. I think their head coach, Kirk Ferentz, is just totally underrated. He's a great head coach. He's been great for a long time at Iowa, and the culture at Iowa is phenomenal. Now, there are some two quarterbacks I watched that were phenomenal, although first I want to point out uh, Tyler Goodson is a freshman running back for Iowa. Dude, that kid is a star. That kid, Tyler Goodson, if you don't know that name, put him on your radar now. He's a true freshman at Iowa. He is a phenomenal running back. He's really talented. Pay attention to him. There were some flashes last night for Tyler Goodson. I was like, uh, let me write down that kid's name. He's going to be really good in like three years. Ooh, okay. He's really good now. Um, now, there were two great quarterbacks to watch last night. We saw Nate Stanley for Iowa. We saw Tanner Morgan for Minnesota. It was so much fun. Uh, you know, first of all, Nate Stanley had some good passes. I think he also had some bad passes where... He's just, his level of play is really uneven. Tanner Morgan, on the other hand, other hand for Minnesota, continues to impress me. Um, I, I love Tanner Morgan. I wish that um, he had a little more arm strength. I do. But, man, he's got, I love his movement in the pocket, the way he literally holds onto the ball. He moves, his feet are phenomenal. He's got great footwork. I'm a huge fan of footwork. You got to give credit to Tanner Morgan on that. He's really accurate. Um, he did make two decisions during the game. There were, there were two moments I can remember. Where I said, that's a bad decision. He was forcing the ball deep downfield in double coverage. One of them should have been picked off and went through a guy's hands. Um, another one was where he missed another. There was like a, 
a vertical post and then an end cut underneath it. He had the end cut open and he didn't throw to it. Uh, but all in all, Tanner Morgan understands matchups. There was a moment where he said, oh, my senior receiver's being guarded by a freshman. He threw vertically down the left sideline and had a huge completion because he recognizes the matchup. It was phenomenal. His timing's outstanding. Tanner Morgan, the Minnesota quarterback, had a throw where it's like a, a bang post where five-step post, ball's there immediately. He threw the ball with such anticipation, with such good timing, that as the receiver turns to, to look, the ball hits the receiver in the hands. He actually dropped the pass, I think, because it was such an accurate pass that had such good timing. He literally didn't expect the pass. Uh, it's phenomenal. Now, the key to Iowa, the reason why Iowa won the game last night is two things. Number one is early in the game, they were prepared to stop Minnesota's RPOs. They decided, okay, if the running back is lined up on the right side, that means he's going to go across the face of the quarterback. And then on the same side as the running back, usually in an RPO, which is a run pass option, they're going to fake the run to the left. And then there will be a slant on that same side as the running back. And so the defensive end on the running back side for Iowa said, what we're going to do is if the tackle blocks you, puts his hands on you, all you're going to do is try to block the pass. They're going to throw a slant near you, jump up, knock that pass down. And they did that multiple times. It worked effectively. It was great. Iowa was well prepared. That's a good coaching moment for Iowa where they said, oh, Minnesota has a tendency to throw a slant to that side of the running back. We're going to prepare for that. We're going to jump up. We're going to knock that ball down. Great job by Iowa being prepared and executing when the time came. Another moment that really, really was beneficial to Iowa. A, a moment, series of moments, a, a thing that happened in the game, I don't know. How do, you, how do you put that properly? But regularly at the end of the game, Minnesota faced third and long. And that is when A.J. Epinesa, I hope I'm saying it, I think it's Epinesa. All I know about A.J. Epinesa is that he's a phenomenal defensive end. Uh, he's gotten a lot of NFL looks. I don't know if he's a first-round defensive end or not. He's really, like in the Big Ten, he's a big deal, A.J. Epinesa. He was phenomenal last night for Iowa. He's an NFL defensive end at some level, to some degree. And, oh my gosh, he just dominated. Uh, in passing downs for Minnesota, he wreaked havoc. He just over and over and over again made gigantic plays against their tackles. And I was so, so impressed with A.J. Epinesa and the way he just took over that game. Whether he, it was either he had a sack or he forced Tanner Morgan to move and get out of the pocket or he forced Tanner Morgan to throw an incomplete pass, regularly A.J. Epinesa's presence on defense for Iowa disrupted the Minnesota offense, and that is a huge key to victory why Iowa beat Minnesota is this NFL player had an incredible game and took over, and that's the power that a great defensive end can have on a game. Now, there's another narrative that People keep like want this. It's like people want this narrative to exist because it's so easy and it's such low hanging fruit. Um, people want the narrative to exist that you know Minnesota just wasn't ready for this game because because I get it. You know Minnesota's a new team on the scene. They've never been this successful before, and they're nine and zero. And you know, they lose a game where they had a couple moments where they could have played better. And it's like the easy thing to say is, well, clearly Minnesota, they just weren't ready. Ah. Uh, Nah, I don't, I don't think it's true. I, I think Minnesota was ready. I think Minnesota lost a close game against a team that is pretty evenly matched with them. I think if Iowa and Minnesota play each other, uh, they split that series. I mean, I really think that there are two teams that are very evenly matched. I think Iowa might be slightly better. Um, now, there were some, mistake, you know, the, some mistakes where uh, on defense, Minnesota missed assignments or Minnesota had a really key dropped pass on the goal line later in the game. Um but the reality is that Minnesota lost to a good football team. I mean, that's just the truth. It was a hard-fought game, and I, I hope that Minnesota learns from that game. They're now 9-1, and one. and here's the key is the next, next two games are crucial if Minnesota wants to play in the Big Ten Championship game. They play Northwestern, and then they play Wisconsin down the road. Uh, Northwestern is their next game, and then on November 30th, they play Wisconsin. That's what matters for them. they got to flush this game. they got to watch the film. They got to learn from it. They got to do better next time. And then they have a Northwestern team that's not terrible uh, to tune up and get ready for their biggest game of the year at the end of the year Minnesota against Wisconsin. It's a huge rivalry game, and they're two of the best teams on their side of the Big Ten. It's, it's going to be a huge deal that really, really matters. And uh, I'm excited to see what happens. I, I hope, I would love to see. I think Minnesota's a good story. It would be really, really cool 
to see them play in the Big Ten championship game. I hope it happens. They I, I, they didn't clinch it today. Uh, I guess yesterday against uh, Iowa. But they have a chance to do it in the next two weeks. And I just want to see them show up big time against a really good Wisconsin team that, you know, Iowa played Wisconsin really, really close. They barely lost. And Minnesota played Iowa really, really close. They barely lost to Iowa. And, you know, Minnesota never, ever led the entire game. Iowa took the lead in their first drive. They scored three drives in a row in the first three drives of the game. And Iowa never looked back. After those first three drives, Iowa only scored three points. But those th- first three drives and those first three touchdowns against Minnesota really cost them. And so uh, I-, I think Minnesota's a good football team. And I'm excited to see their future. I think they're building something with P.J. Fleck. They had a moment where... <clears throat> The multiple moments where they burned timeouts before I think they should have. That really, really cost them. But moving ahead, I'm excited to see what Minnesota does against Wisconsin and against Northwestern. And I still think Minnesota, I'm not giving up on them because they had they lost one game. You know, people are like, oh, Minnesota, they lost. They're not ready. Iowa, yeah, yeah. No, Iowa's a good football team. And Minnesota's season is not over by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm excited to see what's next for them. All right, guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. When I return, we're going to do Ask Zach. Uh, we'll do, we have a t- segment about Tua Tongue of Aloha. I'm excited for that. We'll talk about Miles Garrett a little more, regrettably. I want to remind everybody that you can buy shirts for Strong Opinion Sports. If you don't know, uh, you go to shirtsforyourpeople.com forward slash Strong Opinion Sports. You can buy them until November 25th. That means you have about a week left to buy a shirt if you want one. They're a limited release. I'm really excited. Uh, you can buy a premium cotton blend. That's a, just a typical cotton shirt, but it's high, really high quality material that I'm proud of and I found myself. You can buy a, a premium cotton blend shirt. That's $20. You can also buy, uh, or if you want to buy, the one I wear is a performance style shirt. It's a stretchy shirt. Uh, it's like a shirt you would work out in. That shirt is a performance style shirt. It's $25. So again, premium cotton blend, $25. Performance style, excuse me, premium cotton blend is $20. And a performance style shirt is 25. You have until November 25th to buy shirts. Shirtsforyourpeople.com forward slash strong opinion sports. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. When we return, we'll do Ask Zach. I hope you're having a great day, and I will be right back. All right, we are back. Uh, it's time for Ask Zach, my favorite segment of the show. Uh, this is a segment that I do at the end of every single podcast. Uh, people who support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. It's a dollar a month. You can give me more if you want. Uh, please do. It helps me pay my rent, literally. Um, but a dollar a month gives you access to submit questions to a forum on Patreon. Uh, not a forum. You can send questions to me on Patreon through Patreon's DM service, or you can comment on a post on Patreon. Um, but I only accept questions on Patreon. And what I do is I do not guarantee if you send a question, I do not guarantee to answer it on the show. But I do guarantee if you send in a question, I'll look at it with my eyeballs. And then I pick the top couple at the end of every single episode and do answer the top couple at the end of every single podcast. In this segment, I call it Ask Zach. I want to read the first question. It is from Patrick. Patrick writes in and says, Hi, Zach. What's up? Not much. Just doing a podcast. (laughs) He says, After his season-ending injury on Saturday, do you think Tua should stay another year in college or should he declare for the NFL draft anyways? And do you think if he declares for the draft, how much will his, his draft stock fall Greetings, Patrick. Um, yeah, to me, Tua is going to the NFL now. It's done. It's over. Say goodbye to Tua. I would be shocked. I'd be very, 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 very surprised if Tua came back for another year. Uh, he doesn't owe Alabama anything. He won them a national championship. Um, and really, the truth is that I, I see a Like, Tua is such a competitor. I see a world where he could come back and, you know— want to win a, a national championship and come back with a vengeance and do that. Make that, I guess that's possible, right? I, won't, I don't want to throw that out completely. But in my opinion, he's gone. Um, he had a great career at Alabama. He's projected to be a top 10, top maybe top five pick in the NFL draft. A lot of teams would love to have Tua. He's phenomenal. The Steelers right now, like there's a question I'll talk about later. Um, actually, I'll just get into it later. I think the Steelers would love to have Tua Tungvaloa. He'd be phenomenal. Um, and... To me, does it hurt his draft stock? No. He, he dislocated his hip. He's out for the year. Um, I think it's really just precautionary. I, my guess is, and this is a, a total guess, by the way. I'm not a doctor. have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, my guess is that the next time we see Tua, 
will be either at his pro day or at the NFL Combine throwing a football. And then he'll be in the draft and he'll be a top 10 pick. And the rest is history. I don't know why he would stay. Uh, he's been injured now twice this year. He's not getting paid for any of the work he's doing in Alabama. Uh, and so, like, a lot of guys, I know a lot of guys, uh, there are people at Washington State University. They're backups, and they are student athletes. A student athlete has college ahead of their, their career playing sports because when their time playing a sport is over, they're going to need their degree, and they're going to need to go be an accountant or an engineer or go get a job somewhere in the professional world or what's the the uh, the corporate world, right? Tua is not a student athlete. Tua, Tua is an athlete student. What that means is the athlete part of Tua's life is way more important, and that is actually his career. Tua is not going to work as a financial advisor. Tua is not going to work as a an accountant. Tua is going to have a career as an NFL quarterback. He's an athlete student. And so in my opinion, he's eligible for the draft. He's going to be a top 10 pick and he has an opportunity to make millions and millions and millions of dollars. There is no way that Tua doesn't go to the NFL draft in my opinion. Uh, the only motivation I can possibly think of is, hey, I have unfinished business. I didn't win a national championship my final year. I think I have more in the tank. I, I could see that potentially happening. Not, not really. Uh, that's a if there is a world where he comes back to college, that is why. But in my opinion, two is gone, um, and he's going to shut it down. Well, he did shut it. He's out for the year, and uh, the next time we see him will be entering the NFL draft. That is what I think will happen with Tua, and I don't think it hurts his draft stock at all. Uh, I'll, uh, he plays a position that is so desperately needed, and he does it so well that he's probably going to be out for the rest of the year, and still, still be the second quarterback, or maybe even the first quarterback chosen in the upcoming NFL draft. Dominic writes in, he says, Hey Zach, love your show as always. My question this week is, what's your opinion on the idea of skipping college and heading straight to the pros in sports right out of high school? Primarily primarily basketball and football. Thanks, Zach. Um, it goes back to that same, same like, I, I had the phrase I just talked about, student athlete. A student athlete needs this needs his degree. An athlete student does not. But it's very like literally like once every three years do we get an athlete that doesn't need time in college. They can go like in basketball, it's what like LeBron, I think Zion could have done it. I mean, like Kobe. I mean, it's very like very, very rarely do you see a player who's ready at 18 years old to play in the NBA. In fact, often guys who are one and done aren't ready till their second year. Ben Simmons didn't play at all until his second year in the NBA. He literally got hurt and got sat down and they tanked and didn't need him. Lonzo Ball wasn't great his rookie year. He'll be better this second year, right? Most NBA players, most lottery picks, the top 10 picks that are 18 years old, aren't great. But teams say, we're picking you for your potential. We'll take you as an 18 year old. We'll develop you for a year. And in three years, we expect you to develop a new all-star. But most people, most human beings aren't ready to be professional athletes at 18 years old. There are very few situations where I like this. Um, the people who I like to go play, I think the XFL now is, is a new emerging football league. And there are guys who are really gifted athletes who have bad grades. And they might go from a junior college straight to the XFL because they're that talented. And the XFL will take them. Or guys like maybe, I think Trevor Lawrence is a guy who would be interesting as a quarterback in the XFL. Now, we're learning he's not as good as we thought he was last year, but that was a narrative last year. Could Trevor Lawrence go to the XFL early? Like, I don't know. Um, but my point is very, 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 very rarely is there a situation where I think a guy should go straight from high school to play professional sports. But once every five to ten years in basketball, literally, like Zion, LeBron, Kobe... Uh, like even Michael Jordan wasn't ready right out of high school to play in the NBA. <laughs> it's just, it's very rare to find a guy who's that physically dominant. A guy from 18 to 22 is a different physical beast. I mean, it's just a different person. So it's very rare. And I, I don't think it happens very often or should happen very often. Jackson writes in and says, Hey Zach, I'm a diehard Steelers fan. And every time I see Mason Rudolph throw a pass, I have to hold my breath. 
<laughs> if the Steelers were to able to draft any college quarterback in the upcoming draft, who do you think would be the best fit for their system? Uh, the best fit is Tua for the Steelers. Uh, the way they Tua reminds me of Big Ben, and uh, for one reason, uh, their deep ball is very similar. I think Tua has the best deep ball in all of college football. It's perfect. He's highly accurate, like 40 yards and farther downfield. Uh, he's got the best ball location. Tua has a gigantic arm. He would be able to play in the cold weather of Pittsburgh very well. I love Joe Burrow. I don't think Joe Burrow would work as well in the North. I think Joe Burrow is best suited for like Miami or I think Tua works well in Cincinnati. I think that's, that might be where he literally goes is Cincinnati. Um, but I, I, I think Tua would be great with the Steelers. Now, they're not going to get Tua unless they trade like five first round picks to get Tua. It's not going to happen. So who could they pick up? Uh, I wish I had an answer for you. I think they don't have an answer for you. I think the best hope, honestly, for the Steelers, and look, I will know more. I'll be able to answer that question better in around end of March, early April by the time. Because what I'm going to do in, for the draft process this year is I'm going to pick eight to ten quarterbacks and do one episode. Literally the entire, it'll be like three hours, is a film analysis back to back to back, to back, to back, to back, film analysis of the college quarterbacks. Because, by the way, I can't monetize a video with college film. I get in trouble for it all the time. Uh, and so what I'm going to do, is I'm just tired of it. And so my my college draft episode will be one episode. I'll try to get a sponsor for it. And uh, it'll be, hey, these are the eight quarterbacks I'm interested in. And through that process, I'll learn a guy who's probably a fifth-round pick or a second-round pick or a third-round pick that the Steelers could pick up to replace Big Ben. I think the best hope for the Steelers, though, right now is you just got to hope and pray that Big Ben doesn't retire. He comes back and plays next year because Mason Rudolph is not the answer, and I don't think they're going to have an opportunity to draft a guy to replace him this year. I don't think that guy is available because all the good quarterbacks will be gone early. So that's how I would answer that question, Jackson. I'm sorry for you. Uh, I hate watching. You know, Mason Rudolph is awful and hard to watch for me as well. Now, Dig Great Destroyer, D-I Great Destroyer writes in. He says, hey, Zach, love the show and your opinion slash analysis. Analysis is. That's a hard word. I really think you are doing a great job. Exclamation point. Thank you, man. I uh, thought I'd do my part to help by sending some questions. So here they go. There are two of them. You have said that rookie quarterbacks should be given three years to develop before calling them a bust. In relation to this, number one, I'll answer them one at a time. In Josh Rosen's case, I believe you once said that you consider this to be his first year since he's on a new team, on a new offense. If he were traded away once again after the 2020 draft, would you still consider that season to be his first year, his second, or would you be calling him a bust? Would be calling him a bust to be fair in that case? I think if, if the Dolphins moved away from Josh Rosen, it would not count as him being a bust. But yeah, I would say, look, now we're two years into Josh Rosen. He's already on his third team. I would say that so far, he's been a bust. The two teams that have taken him haven't used him and have failed him. Um, but if he goes to the Dolphins, or goes to the, excuse me, the Vikings, for example, if he went to the Vikings, sat behind Kirk Cousins for a year, and then two years from now he found it. Like, I think there's hope for Josh Rosen beyond just this year. I think if he goes to another team, then I'll say he's played one year. We'll give him two more years. We'll see what happens. Uh, cause the two years with one, t with two bad teams, I'll just combine them and say, that's your first year. You've been in the league two years. You got two years left to prove whether you have it or not. Um, what's the other part of that question? Would you still consider him, would you be calling him a bust? I just don't think he's a bust yet. I don't think it's, I, I don't even know if the, the Dolphins are done with him. I don't, I honestly don't know if the Dolphins are going to move off of him or not. It's possible the Dolphins simply just aren't trying to win like, I, or they're trying to protect him and develop him quietly. I have no idea. I literally cannot, for the life of me, figure out what the Dolphins are doing in that quarterback situation and what they're doing with Josh Rosen, whether they believe in him or not. I cannot figure it out. The second part of this question, he says, how much do you think that teams just drafted quarterbacks but find themselves... How much do you think the teams that just have just drafted a quarterback but find themselves on the race for the number one pick, the Jets, the Redskins, should be tempted to use the remainder of their season to evaluate whether their, quarterback, whether their quarterbacks are worth replacing by someone in the 2020 draft class. In other words, should Darnold or Haskins be concerned? <sighs> should they be? Uh, I think Haskins should be. I don't think he... Well, I, don't, I think if I was a general manager of the Redskins, Dwayne Haskins should be concerned. 
but he shouldn't be concerned because they're not going to replace him. Uh, if the Bears, if the Chicago Bears have had Mitchell Trubisky for three years, this is year three with Trubisky, and they might not get rid of Trubisky after this year. If the Bears are unwilling to get rid of Mitchell Trubisky, who's terrible, after three years of bad suckiness, awfulness, three years in a row, then there's no way the Redskins are going to get rid of Dwayne Haskins after just one year. And there's no way the New York Jets are going to get rid of Sam Darnold after just two years, especially not when they just decided and just announced, hey, we're bringing back Adam Gase again next year. We're doubling down on this coaching decision we made, and we're doubling down on this quarterback. Dwayne Haskins and Sam Darnold should not be concerned at all because the culture right now in the NFL is and by the way, I think Sam Darnold's good. For, for, the, for, the, for the record, I have no idea about Dwayne Haskins. The sample size is so small. What I've seen is terrible so far. But I think Sam Darnold can play. I think he's in a bad situation with a bad owner, bad management, and I think probably the wrong head coach. So we'll see with Sam. But the culture right now in the NFL is if you draft a quarterback in the, first, in the top 10, you give that guy at least three years before you move off of him because that's such an, a valuable pick you can't face the fact that you wasted it. Like, the Cardinals trading away Josh Rosen and replacing him with Kyler Murray is so rare. We might literally never, ever see that ever again where they pick a guy and then immediately flip him and use their first overall pick to draft another quarterback in a succeeding year. I don't think we'll ever see the Josh Rosen situation ever, ever again. Are those the questions I have? Okay. I had one more I wanted to answer. Um... Uh, I don't know how much we're going to go in depth with this question. But John writes in, he says, what are your thoughts on the fight between Mason Garrett? Well, uh, what is his name? Miles Garrett. What are your thoughts on the fight between Miles Garrett and Mason Rudolph? Does Mason also deserve a suspension or are his actions justified due to the late hit? Do you think Garrett will miss any games next season? What are your thoughts on possible legal action? I, I just, I only wanted to bring this question up because I, uh, there's one part of this whole thing that I've been stewing because I've had a lot of time to think. The minute that the fight happened, I was like, I'm going to sit on this. Uh, I mentioned it very briefly. I think literally all I said was, hey, Miles Garrett was wrong. It's unacceptable. End of story. You can't defend him because I stand by that. And like, I don't want to talk about a fight. I want to talk about football. I love football. I love talking about quarterbacks. I want to talk about Mason Rudolph and how did he play? I don't want to talk about Mason Rudolph getting into a bar fight at the end of a football game. But the one thing, the more and more and more I think about what happened between Miles Garrett and Mason Rudolph, the thing that sticks out to me that I cannot believe <laughs> is there were eight seconds left in that football game. The game was over. I, I, I forgot that. Like For some reason, I just like... I got so caught up in the moment, I just I didn't escape. Like, I know that it's not defensible at any point in the game, but to have your team with eight seconds left in a football game, it's not really like it's worse or better. It's just more sad. It's more disappointing that you're up two touchdowns with eight seconds left, and you have a player make a horribly dumb decision and get suspended for the rest of this year and maybe part of next year. And, oh, by the way, he's a former number one overall pick. He's maybe your best player on your entire team. He's a huge impact player on defense. He had a phenomenal game that game. He's now out for the rest of the year because of a dumb decision he made with eight seconds left. It's not necessarily worse because there's eight seconds left. It's just it's more painful because it's even more stupid. It's so dumb what he did. You cannot do what he did. It's terrible. But what Miles Garrett did... Doing that with eight seconds left is the dumbest thing of, I just cannot fathom. Like, the more I think about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that really happened as the game was over. <laughs> like, oh. Now, does, does Mason Rudolph, no, Mason Rudolph um, was hit late, in my opinion. Like, watch, if you go watch it, the ball's away, the play is over, and then Miles Garrett, for whatever reason at the end of the game, because he's just trying to get a late hit on the quarterback, just pile drives Mason Rudolph into the ground when the play is way over. It's like, well, that's unnecessary. And so for Mason Rudolph to retaliate is fair. I think the one people, like the, the, the people that I think I struggle with um, suspending 
are the Steelers offensive linemen because and you you have to suspend like if you if you punch somebody or you kick somebody you have to suspend people because there has to be a principle in the NFL that we don't tolerate fighting it's not allowed so from that standpoint it makes total sense and it's totally fair that the Steelers offensive linemen were punished and that they were suspended but man you're protecting your quarterback from getting hit in the head if you if I'm an offensive lineman and you punch my quarterback I'm going to retaliate too whether that's right that's a horrible politically incorrect what I just said by the way could get me like attacked like just horribly politically incorrect I understand but I get an offensive lineman saying that's my guy and defending my quarterback like that's my quarterback like I get it like that just makes sense to me so uh the part that I just can't get over, and I don't want, I don't like talking about fighting, right? This is not, this is a sports podcast. This is not a UFC podcast. This is not a podcast about wrestling or yada, yada. This is a podcast about sports and about football. And that was not a, a sports thing, that fight. That was just a brawl that was stupid and unnecessary. So I don't want to talk about more than that, but I just can't get over it. It happened with eight seconds left. The game was over. It just adds insult to injury, man. It's just like, oh, the more I thought, like the one thing that just stuck in my craw, the more I thought about all that, I was like, you know, it's just unbelievable it happened with eight seconds left in the football game. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Uh, quick reminder at the end of every show, uh, if you're struggling, please go get help. Uh, three years ago, my younger brother died. He took his life, and uh, it was heartbreaking. And I learned two painful lessons when that happened. Number one is if you're struggling, please go get help. Don't suffer in silence. My brother did. He never shared his struggles. Uh, one day, I went to my brother's house and found him dead on the floor. And he never told anybody he was having a hard time. He just offed himself. And that's, that's miserable and painful. And so the suicide hotline is 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. I, I beg you and encourage you, if you're struggling, go talk to somebody. Go get help. Don't suffer in silence. Go reach out. Uh, and please go get help if you're struggling. The second part of that is I didn't make it clear enough to my brother, hey, I'm here for you. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here for you. I love you. I believe in you. So please be kind to the people in your life. Make it clear that you love them, that you're there for them. Don't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations. Don't be afraid to branch out beyond football and basketball and sports and movies and video games. Don't be afraid to have a real deep conversation and make sure the people in your life know how much you care about them and how much you love them. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about the NFL games that are happening right now. What's happening? What's going on? We'll talk about them. It'll be fun. Uh, I have a more film analysis planned this week. And uh, analysis is. That's it. Analysi? What's the plural of analysis? Analysis says, right? It's rough. It's brutal. My name is Zach Schaumler. Hope you have a great day. But I'm bum. Bam. We are done. <laughs>